So one of the fun facts about this table is that collectively we have paid off over $1.7 million in debt. We can teach all the budgeting debt tricks in the world and everything like that. You need money to make money. You need money to save money. You need money to get out of debt. I want to talk about grind culture. Mm. Another day, another dollar. Yeah. Well, somebody said, ooh, a million days, a million dollars. We don't have a million days. Yeah. Hustle culture was built into us from the very beginning. You can't really change the system right. necessarily, but you can show to help pimp the bug out of it. That's what I do every day. Food is a universal language. When we eat together and drink together, we learn together. And there are few topics more important to learn and more taboo than, than money. money. So join us as we travel around the country, supporting small businesses, enjoying delicious food, having amazing drinks, and, and putting money on the table. like the end of like a long road trip that we've been yes. on. Yes. So I really appreciate y'all coming out. Um, I will also say one of the reasons why we wanted to bring y'all, as we were thinking about the common thread between all of you, is your ability to tap into like culture and be entertaining and to use that as a way or a lever to reach people. And I wanted to ask, is that something that you guys do naturally or is that something that you thought like i'm gonna do that because i hear your musical influences in your content yo what's up this is marcus from black mary and they're free and let's talk about four ways to make money in real estate i i hear the music and the dance and all some of the things that you guys are doing because it just makes it more fun and entertaining and I think it takes the edge off for a lot of people but I'm just curious like is that something that you guys just do or like was that like strategic I think it starts off natural but then once you see a positive response it becomes part of your strategy because it's like this topic of finances it can be kind of dry, dry. dry. And so yeah <laughs> He was cycling through. He was like, how do I say this without trying to diss anybody? Diss them. Money has been talked about in a way that nobody feels like it's approachable. But fuck with me. We can talk, you know what I'm saying? Like, we can talk about money and we can make it fun. Like, it doesn't have to be all of that. But if that's done intentionally, I feel like to, to make other people think that that's not for them. It's for you, boo, come through. That's, that was always my perception that that's not for me because I can't hear my voice in it. I don't see people that look like me in it. So I felt like it was my responsibility to put it out there and like, yes, you too <laughs> can get money. Yes. You know, you too, you too, you too can be ratchet and get money. You know what I'm saying? My approach like, is like, we need to be fun. We have to be it's like, the whole reason I got into finance is because I was like, why is no one having fun? This yes. is the worst, right? Like, why I wouldn't- is it so serious? Why all is it so time? serious? And for me, like my audience, I try to hit a younger audience. I try to hit young people. And so it meant, like it's mandatory. Fun is mandatory. Yes. Relatability is mandatory. Laughing is mandatory. Culture is mandatory. Yes. Like to me, there was, it was like this giant disconnect and people are like, why won't young people learn about money? I'm like, would you learn about money like this if you were young? Like, how are, we have to make this connection. We have to have fun. There's like hierarchy and power built into wealth 
And so when people who have money assume that position, they assume they have to be teaching at all times. I have to be the expert. Yeah. I have to prove that I know more than you for you to listen to me. Right. But the reality is we learn from our peers, we learn from our stories, and we learn when we're having fun. And I think what we bring, us influencers or content creators, whatever you want to call yourselves, like we bring that, we bring that to the table. And I think that's so important. I don't know if it's just me with my head up the butt of personal finance in my own time, but I feel like we're all part of this revolution of just like, fuck that noise. Like we're not gonna do it, you know? Like we're refusing and we're understanding that like, when you speak in that like polished expert manner, you're only speaking to a certain cohort. It's very much on purpose and only a certain cohort is gonna understand that. And so we're just like, all of us in our different ways are busting the doors open and being like, no, my people are coming in and we speak like this. Don't fall for the gas. If you're gonna build true wealth, at some point you'll probably need to leverage credit. So let me tell you how to get a good credit score. And we need this and I can be the translator, I'll be the in-between. Yeah. And it's, it's so exciting to be part of a movement. Like I no longer feel like I'm like a outlier and I'm the only one. I'm like, absolutely I'm not the only one. There's so many of us out here. Which is why this is so exciting to get to like, like the Avengers. But there is a backlash, there is a backlash though. There is a backlash when you you not enough to certain people, and I'm like, I wasn't for you anyway, so, ugh. <laughs> you know, like, but it does kind of sting a little bit when you feel like you're not accepted in certain personal finance circles because you not like them. But no, nah, I'm here because I'm not like you. Ladies and gentlemen, her. Part of what drew me to the space was that I felt like things were changing in money as a whole, and like that we were going through a financial and technological revolution. And now, like that is like here and in the forefront. So I wanted to ask you guys, like, what you feel has changed, like, just in money and in the money media space, like, from the time you started to where you are now. For a lot of people. It's, it's, it's like you're, we're graduating, right? Because we kind of came into this space on the debt-free uh, <laughs> level, right? I feel like a lot of us kind of, that was a fresh, the freshman class, right? But then as you grow, you like, okay, that's just, that's really level one, you know what I mean? So now I feel like we're all transitioning uh, to more of the wealth building side of it, you know? And I think that that is really cool to see, you know? A lot of people that came in in our, in our, in our time frame and kind of evolving. And so it's, it's really interesting, actually. Work used to be like career, like you have to attain like these certain levels and then like that was your life, that was what your life was focused around. And I'm like, fuck work. Like I'm trying to figure out how I can work less every yes. single day. Uh -huh. And I feel like that's a common thread a lot and, and not just in our community like especially with the pandemic i feel like that shifted a lot of people like wait a minute <laughs> like this work thing ain't what's it what what what's happening right now like we really need to shift. i think a lot of people fell out of love with work as a concept last year they realized that they're working loving back as much so now they want to play it cool yeah <laughs> I think like that's a major shift. So a lot of people are looking at like finances as a source of freedom in a different kind of way where it was like in our parents' generation, it was like the stability behind finances. It was like you work at this job for 50, 11 years, you get this pension, then you'll be cool. Like that was that. Let's like work. Who wants to work? Like when I tell people, I'm like, yeah, I'm not really about. I'm trying to work less. And they're like, well, how are you gonna do that? My money can work so much harder for me than I can work for it. Like I, it don't have no sick days. It don't have no days off. Like you know what I'm saying? Like make it work. Like that's that's the whole thing. And I and I feel that shift globally. And that's the biggest thing that has changed. Like since I started, like it was, it was more about like debt freedom and credit and getting a good credit score. And now it's about, well, how can I work less and really own my life? Yes. I think we are authentic in showing not only how to get the money, but like what to do with it, what it means to put your values where your money, 
What is it? Put your money where your value is. See, yeah. see, I told you no tequila. I think that's the biggest difference because there is a blueprint of people who have made money online, who have gotten very successful brands and platforms talking about money, but there isn't one that shows you now when you got all this money, when you have all this power, when you have all this influence, what do you do to move the collective forward? And I feel like that's what differentiates our like cohort, our class, is because we're actually showing people this is what it looks like to influence legislation, to start a nonprofit, to work with financial companies and consult on diversity initiatives, yes. to go to companies and talk to them about benefits. Like we're doing all that work and I think that's incredible. You can see the financial companies are now coming up to us right. and being like, can you consult? Can you be our spokesperson? Yeah. The Chases and the Bank of Americas of the world are now being like, can you be can our you influencer? <laughs> yeah. Because we went ahead of them. We, we learned their language, translated it for ourselves, and then taught our people and then kept moving in our own language. And so now they're coming after us, which really shows us it's we're in a position of power and privilege, but it's also very scary. Like we've been saying, there's no blueprint for what to do. So we got to navigate it morally ourselves. I want to talk about grind culture, because I think that is something that, everybody know what I mean when I say grind culture? This, obs oh. this obsession with do more, earn more, invest oh, more. Yes, 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 yes. You sleeping, yes. why you sleeping, you know, like all of that. Because I feel like that has, that's also something that has changed a little bit. Um, and I wanted to get your thoughts on, not necessarily is it a good thing or a bad thing, but um, it's like, what are your thoughts on it? And like, what's the balance between like, motivating people to like work harder, to think differently, and also like, protecting people from like ushering them into burnout. burnout and stress and like destroying the family structure and all of those things like have you have you experienced that and like what are your thoughts on that? right I, for, for us i think it's kind of this delicate uh, balance because like we when we are writing or when we're posting we're motivating people motivating them to be the best them the best you is not on a couch but it's probably doing something productive yeah. but i know that i'm sure that you've heard this phrase um another day another dollar yeah. well somebody said oh a million days a million dollars but the truth is in order for i mean we don't have a million days we don't have a million days i think it's a subsidiary of our parents culture which was work 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 and so we're mixing that with you know, the, the, the things we know now, but we, it, 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 it translates as hustle, hustle, hustle. When it's like, no, there's actually another level, which is make your money, you know, work, work, work for, you. for you. I mean, like, we work hard for the things that we're passionate about, but that's different than you working hard for somebody else to make some money off of you. This may be an unpopular opinion, but I do think there are seasons for grind culture. Yes. Very similar to what you said, where yes. it's just like, there's a time where people could be doing more and they ain't. Yes. And then they come and they're like, oh, I just want to do it. It's I'm like, my 20s. come on now. And I hate to like a, subscribe an age to it or like a yeah. stage of life because everybody's different, right. but like it usually is your 20s. Oh. <laughs> it usually is, the you know, the early <laughs> mornings where nobody's bothering you or yeah. late nights where ain't nobody like blowing up your phone, like the dark winters, the cold winter. Like there's a season for grind yeah. and it's like, I think what we need online is more nuance that like enables that balance where it's like, I'm telling you to get your ass up today, mm -hmm. but I don't mean like every day. I'm telling you to do yes. your best every day, but I know that your best is gonna change. Right. If you ain't feeling well, your best is gonna be different than on days where you're hundred percent. It has to be like that though. Like it a friend of mine, be. like she really, she equates it to being a peach tree. A peach tree does not bloom and give off fruit 24, 7, 365. Right. Right. There's a winter and it, you need a winter as a tree. Yes. You need to, compartmentalize and go inside and grow and because if you bloom 24 7 you will die, die in 10 minutes <laughs> you will die. it's like That's being awake forever all the time it's like at some point we're not meant to do we're that we're not meant to be a steady state of anything exactly forever. for me hustle culture is so personal because i'm a child of immigrants both of my parents immigrated here from the philippines for so many of us who are children of immigrants hustle culture is in our blood yes. we learned hustle culture before we learned anything in the world and we also learned that Hustle culture got our parents here, got our families here, and it got us all the good things in the world. And so, exactly. All gas, no brakes. All gas, no brakes. You all fucking crash. I think Kirsten said it best because it needs to be nuanced from hustle, hustle, hustle to 
I can make a million dollars on TikTok. Like it needs to be something, <laughs> <laughs> something in between would be nice. Oh, you know what I mean? Like, it's either like... one or the other, but it, it got to be something in between. You know? like, hustle culture was built into us from the very yeah. beginning. And then you have to like beat it out of yourself after that. Like for me, really? when you say grind you culture, hustle culture, exactly. Like it's like it starts with me and my therapist, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. Because like I can I can preach all about like hustle culture and like I'm not grinding, I'm sleeping. But <laughs> like really deep down inside, like my inner child is like grind, bitch. <laughs> you know that's all we know how to get back on the <laughs> fucking hamster wheel. You're hella lazy right now. Exactly. Like, what are you doing right now? Yes. Like, you need to be doing something. Exactly. So it's a personal deconstructing because I could I could like read all the nap ministry that I want and be like, fuck yeah, fuck yeah, fuck yeah. But then I get off nap ministry and I'm like, man, her branding was really cute. I should probably fix my branding. Like, oh, she posted, you know, like it's so ingrained. And so I'm like, I'm trying to scrub it out of myself first. And then hopefully it shows up on my work, but it's so hard. You know, there is, we're human beings. You know what I mean? It's like, you see other people with a huge win. It's like, am I not working hard enough? Like we, I feel like even as entrepreneurs, we go through that same experience as some of the people that we're sort of motivating to do. And we tell them, don't do that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, don't don't uh, get caught up in comparing yourself to other people. But it's hard, you know what I mean? When when you see somebody else that's out there doing something, it's like, oh my God, I used to have to work a whole year for that. Yeah. You know what I mean? And they just got that. So yeah, it's, it's hard, man. It's all working according to plan. Like, you are supposed to get addicted. You're supposed to feel like you're not shit every second of the day. It was never supposed to empower you. It was never, like, the fact that we found each other and found community and are encouraged by each other is a mistake. It's yeah. kind of like a side effect. Yeah. It's a glitch, totally. It was a glitch. Yeah, like the fact that we found each other and we found positivity at all is like great, but really the point of the product is to keep you on as long as possible. And they're not gonna keep you on feeling fuzzy and happy. Right. They're gonna keep you on with your insecurities and your humanity, which is fucked, like fucked up, fucked up. I was part of that system, which is why I was like, bye, once I got dead free, I was like, see ya. <laughs> Going back to what we were saying before, where it, it feels like everyone's financial and maybe even an entrepreneurial journey has shifted naturally over, let's say, the last four or five years. Or what role did, did like your work or traditional job experience play in you changing your financial plan? So for example, in my case, um, it was like a lot of frustration at work, quite honestly dealing with like racism at work. Um, that was enough for me to like reorganize my life and say and reprioritize some things and say nah This is not what I need to be doing for the next five years I've got a better chance at life doing yeah. these things and as a result my financial plan our family's Financial plan was shifted because of it, but I'm just curious like whether or not your work experience good or bad played a role in you changing your sort of financial plan? Because in your case, it's, it sounds like, maybe maybe not, but like definitely you were tired of being the puppet master or part of like this evil machine. Well, that's what was crazy is like, I that's when I really learned the meaning of the phrase, like we are all compromised under capitalism. Everybody is compromised under capitalism. And it felt, while I was at Instagram slash Facebook for two years, it felt icky every day. But at the same time, I was like, I'm the first in my family to ever earn this kind of salary. I'm the first in my family to work at a tech company. Like my mom can brag all day about the fact that I work at Instagram and Facebook and that gives value to her. There was part of me that was like, gross, I gotta quit and like go join Peace Corps if I wanna do good in the world. But at to the same- To make up for all the- To make up for all the- I know, that's right. real. Exactly, that's but at the real. same time I was like, well, how am I ever gonna get financially free if I say no to opportunities like this? You know what I mean? Like, of course there's a case for being like, well, fuck them, you can get there without them. But that was the opportunity that was put in front of me. That was the opportunity that was like in, in my hands. And I was like, I'm gonna work it for all that I can because we have to make compromise choices under capitalism. But I also understood that like, we can teach all the budgeting debt tricks in the world and everything like that. You need money to make money. You need money to save money. You need money to get out of debt. And so that's one of the things like right now I'm writing a book for uh, young people about money and I open up the savings chapter with like, hold up. If you don't make enough money to survive, you can't save money. Yeah. Don't yeah. let anyone tell you anything Here different. You just can't. You're not gonna like there's no magic tricks. Go to chapter seven on how to make more money. For like, we did the same thing. Yes. You can't read a book about exercise. Yes. Right. You know what I mean? Exactly. And it's like you can read as much as you want and it can be a great lesson. Yeah. 
But if you don't have the capital or the money to actually invest, like it's in one aim and not the other. Exactly. You have to participate in capitalism to some degree. And it sucks and it's gross and it's icky. And that's our challenge is like trying to navigate, I don't know, like moral capitalism while trying to come up for ourselves and our families and like come up for our ancestors and break our own like intergenerational curses. It's to eliminate the idea that something is totally good or totally bad. Like as much as icky as it felt, yeah. that company, those companies have done a lot of good in the world too. Yes. They've enabled a lot of connections and a lot of like, you just, there is no like pure, and that's what we've been taught, some through culture, some through religion, some through our parents. We've been taught that there is like purely good and purely evil. And the reality is life is in the gray. Yeah, yeah, that's like. You go in between. You gotta learn how to maneuver these spaces. Like, I just call it pimping the system. Yeah. Like, you gotta learn how to pimp the system. That's you can't really change the system right. necessarily, but you can show the hell pimp the fuck out of it. And that's what I do every day. Yeah, yeah. For, for me, work has become just a, a pawn in the chess game that is, you know, my retirement. I mean, I, I, I eat the meat and spit out the bones when it comes when it comes to work. You know what I mean. Sometimes you're in meetings and you're in uh, or interviews, and they're like, "Well, where do you see yourself five years?" And I'm thinking to myself, "Not here." <laughs> you know, so it's just it's something that I'm leveraging, and and uh, I think that's kind of the common thread with with yeah. us all. You know what I mean? So what about you, Steph? Yeah. So where I work, and I won't say where, but <laughs> internally we call it the golden handcuffs. That's exactly yes. Because, you know, so it's like, I'm glad that I work here. There's a lot of benefits, so it's hard to walk away from it. So it's this balance between security and freedom to where I haven't quite taken that step to be, you know, a flat out entrepreneur, like 100%. So it's like security, freedom, and I'm a security seeker. Like that's my money, like personality. So for me, it's, it's kind of like, figuring out, you know, it's kind of like a, a, a balance, you know, yeah. but I'm getting to that point to where I am close to being fed up, Okay. but I need to get angry. And I think yeah. if I get that angry, my problem. Yeah. I didn't have a chip on my shoulder. Uh -huh. <laughs> Julie used to always say that to me. He was like, your problem is you don't have no yeah. chip on your shoulder. Yeah. You were raised in the streets of Brooklyn. And it's like, no, I wasn't. I'm was, was fine. So there's a really interesting layer of empowerment there that I don't think we talk enough about in financial education. I think, especially when you're talking to young people, people want the map. And when you don't give them the map, they get frustrated. Talk to me if, about that. If you don't give them the map, you don't give them the like steps. They, this is like more than the map. Like I'm a yes. foodie, so it's like, no, they want the recipe. They want everything. They want it. They want it. They want it. They want it. And they also don't want to pay you. Yeah. They want you to do is? it. What they do want you, you to do it in their DMs yes. as soon as possible yes. because you put up a real dancing with your butt in the air about their budget. Like, so then now, <laughs> now you are my personal financial analyst, right? Now you, you tell me what to do. Right, now you tell me what to and do. What to believe. Because standard. this is how they get taken advantage of. Exactly. Like, there is somebody who will be like, oh, okay, I give your money to me. You. Exactly. That's the map. Exactly. And like, the, it's sort of like we're talking about how we all started off talking about budgeting, savings, and debt. And now, as a class, we're moving up to investing, wealth building. It's like, okay, I can tell you five best budgeting tips and five things to do to raise your credit, whatever. But the next level is what you didn't know is that you can choose your own financial yes. journey. Nobody right. told you that. Yes. Nobody yes. taught you you can pick, you can go into investing with real estate or not. You can fuck around the cryptocurrency or not. You can like have $100,000 in emergency savings or not. Like you can pick those things. But we're not, not only were we not raised to have our own opinions about our financial journey, but then when you see other people doing it, you're just like, oh, thank God, it's been so scary. Just give me the fuck, please just give me the map. Just give me the steps. Yeah. And it's it's a it's a big jump for some people to go from, I want the steps, give me the steps, I hope the steps work, to, oh shit, I actually am the captain of my own ship. Yes. I didn't realize that. I didn't know you could be. Like to me, the regular part really sp speaks to me. Like, yeah, we're on our way to richness and what richness means to us. We're also normal ass people and you can make totally different decisions and that's fucking tight. Like, I'm happy for you. Yeah. Whereas I think a lot of us were sold like, hello, I am skeep it about boop beep and there's only one road and if you don't take it, you're a dumbass. <laughs> buy my course, buy my book, buy my podcast. You know, and like, it's, we have to break out of it ourselves. It's, it's not easy though. It's not easy because what sells is shame. You, you wrestle with being, uh, having a hard stance when it comes to finance because you see that uh, others that become popular by having one stance. There's only one way to do it. I'm firm in this. 
and you're like, should I have a hard stance? But it's like, no, there's there's more than one way to skin a cat. And I think like that's that's the dope part about it is you can build wealth in many ways. It doesn't have to be one thing, you know? So that's part of the, of the evolution, I think, for us. Especially if that one way is like, trust me, I'm an old white man. It's gonna work for you, <laughs> young brown lady. I'm like, that's weird that it's not working. Why is it? <laughs> something's not working, something's not connecting. Yeah. So one of the fun facts about this table is that collectively we have paid off over $1.7 million in debt. Oh. <laughs> right? So I'm wondering if you remember, think back to the time where you were in the thick of the debt pay off. Right. Into the thick of it. <laughs> Into the thick of it. <laughs> what do you remember the most? Like, do you think about your struggle meals? Do you think about them days when the check came in? Do you think about like the moment you would send the payments? What do you remember? Like, what's the most like visceral of memory of debt payoff days? And you can't say when it was done. <laughs> Take that off the table. That's exactly what I was gonna say. <laughs> it's, it's like childbirth. You just forget all of the pain right. and, you yeah. know, so it's hard. <laughs> I think it's like when, when we would drop the, the payment on, you know. Making payments. Yeah, we, we would confer like how much, what's the most we can put on it, you know, yeah. for this month or whatever. And just doing that, it was just like, man, it's like a little celebration, you know what yeah. I mean? So I think for me, it was that. The journey. The journey, yeah, yeah. It's definitely the journey. I just remember I did not have any money. And I, in my journey, I did not make more money. I just figured shit out. And I was like, why the fuck didn't I know this? And so that's literally why I started my platform. Like, all I did in the first year was document my debt payoff yep. and then share like every single lesson that I learned. If I learned something on a blog, on a podcast, it was in my content. Mm -hmm. Like that's all I did, but it wasn't for everybody. It was for my homies. We all got girls. You know, I was like, we need to learn this stuff. We need to teach our daughters. Like this is what the fuck it's about. And now it's like the best part of paying off my debt. Like it didn't, I, didn't, I didn't even like realize how much I had paid off until I was like applying for something and I had to do all the math and I was like, damn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But it was really that journey of being like, I can be in control of my money, and that frees up like a whole lot of stuff in my life. And that was the, the biggest part. That was the biggest part. For some reason, when you said that, the memory that came to me was me being on the phone for the first time, and I don't even remember where I, where I read this, but like it was like, the secret is that you have to overpay your monthly payment, first of all, duh and you have to make sure you call the student loan company and tell them to apply it to your principal. Yeah, yeah, and I was like, yeah. tell them to what, what, my what? Like, I don't understand. Yeah. But I remember being on the phone and being like, I would like this overpayment to apply yes. to my principal. Yes. And I'm like scrolling on, I'm like, did I say it right? <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, I would like this blah, blah, blah. And the lady on the phone was like, you want it to what? I was like, I need it to not go to interest. I need you to not push my due date further. I wanted to apply to the principal of this one loan. And she was like, I mean, I guess, like, we can do that for you. And I was like, cool, love it, great. Yeah, 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 from the desk of me, thank you, click. And then I got up and I was like, oh shit, it worked, like, and that's what it takes, are you kidding me? I read that for free off of somebody's blog for free. I practiced it even though I did not feel confident about it. Even the lady on the other line was like, I guess we could do that for you. Even she didn't know what the fuck I was talking about. Like, all that was standing between me and like this debt freedom was these like tips and tricks that just haven't been translated to our people. What the fuck? And like, yeah. that's what got me to make content. It was more, yeah. it was excitement, but also anger at the same time. Yeah. I was pissed. Like even the lady on the phone did not know what I was talking about. Yeah. Yeah. What the fuck? That's like, I remember that. I remember being like, this is a scam. The whole fucking thing is a scam. <laughs> and we have to literally like play telephone and whisper the secrets to each other yeah. so that we can get out of it together. Like what yeah. a scam. I remember the extra checks. So like whenever you're paying off debt, you have like this clear plan of like this check, your paycheck, your every other like week thing. Then all of a sudden there'd be a week, where, a month where you get three checks or you might get like a little, 
you know, a little claim check in the mail okay. from Wells Fargo or from whoever, a little $18 here and there. A little insurance adjustment. A little insurance adjustment. <laughs> yeah. A little escrow situation going on. <laughs> yeah. 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 Anytime we got surprise money, I was so, I've never been happier. And like before, when I get $25 here, $50 here, just be like, okay, I can eat out again. Right. But this time it was like, yeah, the so. universe. So my like, <laughs> hi, like, thank you. Even though that's like normal, I think we just have a pattern, especially when you're in debt, of underestimating how much money you actually make in a year, how much income you actually get in a year. You think it's your salary, you think it's equivalent to your salary, which it isn't because of taxes. But also, like, we get windfall money all the time, whether it's tax refunds, regular refunds, birthday money, gift certificate, like all the things. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Cash back. Cash back, all these things. And it was the awareness for me. So we talked about tech earlier. We talked about FinTech, emerging challenger banks, as they call them. I want to talk about the um, mood of tech in this area. Because you guys are in the Bay Area and tech has been here way longer than it's been in Atlanta. Atlanta is just starting to build a community especially black founders are coming to the area because they know they can get funding and if they can't get funding they can certainly get a community of people who look like them yeah. but i'm curious on what the sentiment of tech is in the bay area it's been blamed for gentrification it's been <laughs> blamed for evil practices and getting us all hooked on the juice of social media but i'm just wondering like is that the general tone or is that just because y'all are in the know and you, you're looking from a different point of view than residents Born and raised in Oakland, like tech has been one of those things that's like a blessing and a curse because I can't even live in Oakland no more. And I don't make crumbs, you know what I'm saying? Like I make a good salary, but for me to live here, I have to live in the hood where I never live. I grew up right down the street. You know, I was born in my house in West Oakland, but that same house is unattainable for me right now. I make a damn good living. So it's like that balance. But then I don't see people like me no more. Like all my friends are all dispersed. I, I, I have loved to see the growth in Oakland, but it's not the Oakland that I grew up in. The Oakland my dad as a Black Panther grew up in. Like it's lost a lot of its soul. We're the, the everyday person. Yeah. So we're about an hour and a half outside of Oakland. Um, the impact of tech it really hurts when it comes to the housing crisis. Like we live kind of in a, a newer development, kind of on the outskirts of Sacramento, and we have neighbors that are from Oakland. Like they from Oakland, you know. So, <laughs> they from Oakland, okay, specifically. Yes. You know, they are. So it's like the they're migrating and they're coming to where we live, and it's raising the housing prices. So it's 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 tough. It's so scary in that way. Like I feel like tech. So I've worked inside of tech, right? Like tech is filled with a lot of young, well-intentioned people, like so many other industries. But it's also as a whole, like it feels like the Bay Area is like this hyper sauna microcosm of capitalism, where all the best things and the worst things about capitalism all happen right here. You know, you see that the wealth gap and the, the wealth disparity is so intense. And when you drive into San Francisco, it's so obvious. It's right there, right in your face. Like people are thriving and making life, absolutely life-changing, life-saving technology, but the city cannot take care of its people who are experiencing homelessness and can't take care of the people who are getting kicked out from gentrification. So it's like, it's true love hate. It's true both sides. It's like, I can see all the fuckery of capitalism right in my backyard. So amazing and so terrible and so destructive at the same time. And like, it's kind of miraculous that even with and because of all that, we build communities that we have real like positive impact. It's a miracle.